You know, quite um, a useful schedule of activities, um, which will run from now till about 12 o'clock. Um, the session is largely focused on the Finance Act and the economic outlook for 2021. Um, the Finance Act has, is something that has come to stay, um, you know, in terms of planning um, with the Nigerian economy. Um, and this is the second consecutive one which we'll be having um, under this administration. Now, in terms of the program of the day, um, we'll be hearing from um, our country's senior partner and our regional senior partner um, at some point. And then the chief economist for PwC in Nigeria, Andrew Nevin, would also come in. Um, and then we'll be hearing the keynote address from the Honorable Minister for, for Finance, Budget and National Planning. Um, and then we would go into the highlights of the Finance Act, which will be handled by the, the tax leader of PwC in Nigeria, um, Taiwo Yedele. And then we'll go into a panel session. Now, it's important that um, if you have questions um, that you would like for the panelists to attend to, that you put your questions into the Q and A um, box. Um, if you're using a laptop, that would be at the bottom right of your screen, um, which you can tap. And then if you have questions, you input those questions there. And that panel session would be happening around um, 11 o'clock, after which at 11.30, we'll be having the Q&A and then we'll wrap up the session. So you see that the program lined up is quite um, exciting um, and we would like it to be as participatory as possible, even though it's virtual. Now, um, in terms of um, the Q&A, if you have a particular question which you would like to direct at a particular panelist, please also refer your question to the panelists so that we can um, ensure that the, the, the person who it's addressed to um, responds. Um, without further ado, I'm going to invite um, our country senior partner for PwC in Nigeria, as well as the regional senior partner um, for PwC in West Market area, Uyi Apata, to give us um, an opening welcome remark. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Kenneth. Um, good morning, and thank you everyone for making out uh, the time to join us for this executive roundtable on the Finance Act 2020 and the economic outlook for in 2021, for Nigeria in 2021. Um, I know about this time last year, we, was, we were referring to the new normal, but now it's clearly the established normal. Um, as we enter the second month of this year, we should begin to have a fair um, understanding of the forces that will shape Nigeria's economy and indeed our tax environment. I think the Finance Act 2020 has introduced, I understand, over 80 new amendments um, and to 14 different existing laws. I mean, I can just imagine this is the second in the series um, after over 20 years. Uh, there are, of course, significant changes to the existing laws which will play a major role in Nigeria's tax environment in 2021. Some of these changes include CBN's foreign exchange rule for imports through buying agents, uh, the transfer window to retirement savings accounts, and of course the ratification of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Um, this is likely to be telling, in my view. Taxpayers need to understand how these recent developments will affect their businesses in order to take advantage of the possible benefits and clearly also minimize potential risks. 
Um, this is especially, in my view, important as businesses are still recovering from the impa impact or the continuing impact of this ravaging pandemic. And of course, judging by the caliber of people we have in this panel or this panel, I believe that today's deliberations will really, really, really be insightful. Um, so let me, on these notes, um, clearly, um, speaker, our keynote speaker today is Mrs. Zainab Samsna Ahmed, the Minister of Finance, Budget, and National Planning. She is um, clearly um, one person that's passionate, engaging, needs to engage stakeholders. So we join, address issues, the issue. Um, because I just removed this difficult time. Honorable Minister, thank you again. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ui. Um, I understand that the minister um, is in transit, so um, she's unable to keep, give the keynote address on the Nigerian economy right now. Um, so we'll be coming back to the keynote address later on in this session. So I will i um, like to um, go to the next segment of the conversation, um, which is the economic outlook for 2021. Um, and to handle that for about 15 minutes is um, Andrew Nevin, who's a partner, as well as the chief economist um, for PwC Nigeria, as well as our West Africa Financial Services Leader. Um, so over to you, Andrew, to speak to the economic outlook for 2021. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the Honorable Minister for, for being our guest today and to all of, the, all of the people participating today. We'll introduce the incredible panel we have shortly. Um, my role uh, now is to just talk a little bit about the economy for a few minutes. Um, and um, I'm just trying to see if I can move my slides here. And my co my discussion is not going to be the normal uh, economics talk. I'm not going to uh, predict the interest rate. I'm not going to predict the exchange rate. I'm not going to predict uh, what the growth is going to be. Um, I'm not going to talk about the budget deficit. What I'm going to talk about is uh, 10 themes that we think are critical for the Nigerian economy in 2021. And and beyond. So really the big picture things. And of course, everyone who's participating today is a critical economic actor in Nigeria. Um, so it's important for all of us. All of us have collectively um, make a decision about where Nigeria is heading. And I think that's important to, to state is that all of us are at events where we hear about Rwanda, we hear about Sweden, we hear about Singapore, we hear about South Korea, we hear about China. We hear about India, uh, but the reality is that at the end of the day, Nigeria has to forge its own path. And I think that while the lessons from many of these places are instructive, Nigeria's specific conditions and the specific conditions of the world and technology this present time mean that Nigeria has to decide its own path. And I think it, it's very critical that we don't get bogged down on kind of trying to emulate someone else's model. I really believe Nigeria has a unique path in the world. Now, I promised 10 themes. Quickly, we'll run through them. Uh, here are the 10 themes. I have one slide on, on each theme. So let me start um, by talking about unlocking dead assets. So this is something that we, of course, put a paper out, uh, I guess, in, in 2019 now. A lot seems like a long time ago. Um, we have dead assets in real estate. The federal government has dead assets. State, state governments have dead assets. The number one thing for making the economy move and to get faster headline GDP growth is unlocking these dead assets. So, of course, a lot of it's in housing, like on the uh, left-hand side of this page. We need to be building 700,000 units of housing every year. Um, and a lot of it, of course, is also, as I said, sort of government assets that need to be producing return. But while these assets don't produce a return, they're not real assets for us. So this is number one thing to think about, unlocking dead assets. Number two thing to think about uh, is the power of the diaspora. 
Um, so we again put out the paper. We didn't invent any new numbers there, but we just pointed out that the impact, the economic impact of the diaspora is in fact bigger than oil on the economy. Uh, the, the official number is about 25 billion U.S. dollars in 2019, I believe. I think the unofficial number is probably quite a bit higher because of all the informal channels. Uh, at the end of the day, the World Bank says one out of two Nigerians are touched by diaspora remittances. This is a huge strategic resource for Nigeria. Now, the other part of it, though, of course, is shows what does Nigeria export? Nigeria exports brains. That's our biggest export out there. And we are earning significant amount of money um, from these brains around the world. And that asset is something that we need to optimize. Now, the interesting thing, if you reflect on it for a minute in our modern world, is so we said it's not no longer the new normal, but it's the... Um, normal normal we can export brains from nigeria without people leaving nigeria and we want to put this on the table as the third theme today that that in fact if you think about nigeria's um, unique conditions and you think about afcfta our ability to, is to export in the short term is not necessarily in manufactured goods two-thirds of the world's economies and services and we are already exporting services uh, from nigeria we have nollywood we have Nigerian financial institutions like uh, Access, UBA, uh, PAGA, InterSwitch going around the continent already. So we are exporting services. And one of our panelists today is uh, the remarkable Amal Hassan, national hero of Nigerian, who has, is, runs the biggest, created the biggest company that outsources um, services to multinationals around the world. So we put on the table here, let's not think about... Uh, manufactured good. Let's export Nigerian brains but without people necessarily leaving Nigeria. The uh, fifth theme that we'd like to put on the table is, of course, we need uh, inclusive, sustainable growth around the country. We need it in every part. We need multiple poles of prosperity in Nigeria. We're 206 million people. If you look at the official statistics as of today, uh, uh, some people are projecting Nigeria be the second most populous country in the world by the end of this century. So things need to happen across the nation. Um, here are some of the things that need to happen in our view. We need innovation hubs, not just in Lagos and Abuja but everywhere we need industrial clusters everywhere and we need education everywhere the sixth thing we want to remind people of is uh, that there's no headline GDP growth uh, without investment um, we all know that we need to have growth of probably six to eight percent inclusive sustainable growth to make a dent in poverty to make a dent in unemployment the governor of the central bank has come out and made it very clear he's aiming for 10% growth. But what are the preconditions for getting that sort of growth? Well, one necessary, but not sufficient, but necessary condition, of course, is investment. So this chart shows the level of investment using the economist term, gross capital uh, formation. And you can see the red line is Nigeria. We're only investing about 17 to 19% of GDP per year. The yellow line is... Um, is uh, uh, and you can see it invests about 26 to 29 percent. It gets six to eight percent growth. It is a mathematical certainty if we continue to only invest 17 to 19 percent that we will only grow at two percent. And of course, our population growth is three percent. So unless investment comes up, it's a mathematical uncertainty that we'll get poorer and poorer per capita. So the urgent question for all economic stakeholders is uh, Nigeria is the greatest economic opportunity on the planet. And yet Nigerians, the diaspora, and people outside those two groups are not investing. And unless that problem is solved, we're not going to get to uh, address our poverty or uh, unemployment issues. Seventh theme, uh, the informal economy. Uh, so uh, the informal economy represents at least 50% of Nigerian economic activity. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the for informal economy, but the reality is in the informal economy, productivity is low, wages are low. So it's an urgent issue, and I know the minister, Honorable Minister has worked on it very hard with a number of her changes to the Finance Act to bring people from the informal economy to the formal economy. And it's a choice. People join the formal economy when there's advantages to joining it, and making sure those are advantages are critical to making this transition from the formal to the informal economy. 
eighth theme, uh, let's not forget our ease of doing business. I mean, we have Dr. Jamoke, another head of PEBEC, executive secretary of PEBEC, who again is another national hero of Nigeria. Uh, we've made great progress over the last few years, both at the national and at many states, uh, but we have some way to go. Um, this chart, I think, though, to, I mean, you might look at it and be not happy about our progress, but to be honest, I look at it and say, when Kenya or Rwanda can, can be um, this strong in this area, it's something that Nigeria can can emulate, um, and we don't, um, you know, we keep the focus on it, and we need to continue to focus on the ease of doing business. Ninth thing, we still have um, some of these subsidy distortions in the economy. These are difficult issues to solve from a social and economic viewpoint. Uh, obviously, exchange rate, the fuel subsidy, and power are the three major ones. Exchange rate in particular right now is in the news. I mean, it's the policy of the federal government of Nigeria through its ERGP and through the CBN to move to a unified exchange rate over time. Um, that's been an uneven road over the last few years. And we all know with the COVID impact and the drop in oil, it's really created pressure in 2020. But it's still an issue that needs to be dealt with in 2021 and beyond. Ninth theme, uh, SDGs. So we are encouraging the nation to move from a GDP lens to an SDG lens. So that is really looking not so much at headline GDP that we talk about all, all, all the time, but really are we addressing problems, the real problems that society has. And um, we embrace the SDGs because they're so intuitive and they make sense because they matter to people. No poverty, quality education, gender equality, life under the ocean, no hunger. These are definable goals, and we think that we should do a, a better job of being able to measure this as the, whether or not Nigeria is making progress. And of course, Nigeria has done a great job with this. Uh, uh, His Excellency President Bahari has fantastic uh, special assistant for SDG, Shalapa Hammond in Lagos, is a real star in this area. But we really think that we should be using an SDG lens and not a GDP lens. I promised uh, one slide per theme, but actually I, I, I fibbed a little bit. I have a few slides on this because we think it's such an urgent issue. Um, I mean, obviously, we've been dealing for the past year with the COVID pandemic, and we're now in the not the new normal, as always says, but the normal normal. Um, we have pent up issues. This is not a Nigerian slide, but global issues around uh, the economic impact. We're unsure of the huge budget deficits in developed countries and the impact that's going to have. Um, unfortunately, we may have or we do have a bigger issue that's on our horizon, which is climate change. Now, Nigeria and Africa has not really contributed to climate change, but unfortunately, like many things in the world, um, it has a disproportionate impact on our situation. And we think that this is a theme that has to come right to the top of the agenda for 2021 and beyond. And we can see around the world, I, I mean, there is just no way to sugarcoat the impact of, uh, of changing climate in many, many places. I mean, this, they would give any number of statistics, which I haven't brought today on that, whether it's extreme heat, you know, whether it's the melting of uh, the Arctic. Uh, of course, I'm Canadian, as, as people know, Canadians, Canada is my original country. Um, Particularly worrying, of course, is the rising sea oceans. I brought this chart because uh, as you, if you look, you can see that um, Nigeria is colored light blue, which means that 10 to 25 percent of the population would effectively be underwater if we had a two degree rise in global uh, temperatures. Uh, I'm not sure you know, what that means, but given our population, that would tell us that we'd have 20 to 40 million people underwater uh, and we're well on target to exceed the two degrees. A little bit of a of a of a um, of a um, small chart here, but this just shows the nexus from the World Economic Forum between climate change, political instability, involuntary migration, potential for failed states, and these are all issues that we face. Because of course, as I, I've just I've talked about the uh, the rising seawaters, the impact that would have on the Delta on Lagos, which would effectively be underwater. And of course, the other impact is the encroachment of the Sahara, which is dri driving. Uh, making it more difficult for agricultural activities in the north. And so we have this impact of these two things together that can't be, we can't minimize in 2021. So um, really, we, those are the issues we want to put on the agenda. And I want to end, though, with one final plea from, from PwC as we, as we think about uh, the economy and the society going forward. Uh, there's a new concept.
OECD, which is called uh, brain capital. And this is really to think about, if you think about what really makes an economy and society work, it's brain capital. And that's not just the skills, but it's emotional intelligence, it's creativity, it's connections with people, it's being able to work in a group, it's being able to deal with dementia, it's uh, not having mental illness in society and depression and schizophrenia. And uh, OECD this year is going to put this on the agenda. We'd like to make a plea for Nigeria to be the first country that says, that we will put brain capital first. As I said uh, earlier in this presentation, Nigeria's largest export is brains. Uh, we have them in abundance. And if we are put brain capital at the center, you know, it has real implications, implications for education, implications for healthcare, implications for the way we manage economy and society. So let me stop there and turn it back to uh, our wonderful moderator, Kenneth. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you very much, um, Andrew, for setting the scene um, with regards to the Nigerian economy. Um, and um, I'm sure that the Honorable Minister um, would also address things from um, the perspective of, of the government. Um, just to mention that the Minister has asked um, for some representatives to join the session. Um, and we have two representatives of the Honorable Minister who would be in attendance at the panel session today. Um, the first one is, I mean, Andrew is going to be the moderator at that panel session, so he'll be doing um, the introductions. But just to let you know that um, Dr. Sira Alade, Special Advisor to the President on Finance and Economy, um, would be part of that panel session as well as Dr. Bode Oyetunde, who's the Special Advisor to the Honorable Minister for Finance, Budget, and National Planning, and Senior Special Assistant to the President on Finance and Fiscal Policy. Um, so they'll be joining us um, for, those, for those sessions. Um, also, you know, as part of the panel sessions, representatives from the private sector, um, would also be there, um, Sam Wanze, um, who's the CEO of Cares um, Oil and Gas, would, would also be part of the session. And already Andrew alluded to the fact that Amal Hassan, um, who's doing a very good job with um, outsourcing and adding value from a Nigerian perspective, would also um, be part of that session. Um, so um, that session would be happening at exactly 11 o'clock. Um, but at this point in time, um, we'll just take the keynote um, address by the Honorable Minister for Finance, Budget, um, and National Planning, um, Zainab Ahmed. Um, and I hear that, um, you know, since she's in transit, um, she has taken um, she has taken liberty to actually um, do the keynote address and and send it across to us. So I'll hand over to um, Abraham to make to 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 um, help us with that keynote address. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think we're still having challenges um, with getting that keynote address out. Um, so I will probably just jump into the next um, session, which is one of the um, reasons why we are here today, um, which is on the Finance Act 2020. The highlights of the Finance Act 2020 um, and to handle that session is um, Taiwo Oyedele, who's the tax leader for PwC Nigeria and West Africa. He's also um, the fis fiscal policy partner um, in Africa. So I'll hand over to Taiwo to take us through the highlights of the Finance Act 2020. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ken, and thank you, Andrew, for that uh, 
overview and some of the key insights in terms of the economy and how we should go about uh, taking care of Nigeria. We are different and so is every country. Um, thanks a lot for that. I'll stand on existing protocols like we normally say in Nigeria. So my uh, presentation is really about looking at the Finance Act and what does it mean for key stakeholders as well as key sectors of the economy. Uh, and by the way, just to um, set the context, this doesn't mean that there are sectors that are not important. So this just means that uh, we are focusing more on the sectors that are most impacted by the changes introduced in the Finance Act. Uh, so um, I'll just go on now. So overview and the economic context is always very important. I always like to say that uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's not just about taxes. Taxes don't stand on their own. Uh, taxes are consequences of business and individual activities that people uh, carry out. So by way of an overview, the, uh, we know that we have the budget for 2021 already. Uh, and in that budget, we know that significant amounts of government spending will be deficit financed. Uh, and that in itself is an indication that we have challenges in the country. And therefore, we need to moderate our expectations in terms of what government can do and what government is unable to do. So the price outlook for crude oil, which is the main source of our revenue, even up to now, uh, at the moment, it's not looking bad, like they will say, uh, in the sense that the price now is over $50 a barrel, and that's more than uh, our target in, in terms of what we have in the budget. So, but then, because we have $40 in the budget, but the question is, you know, can we take that to the bank? The answer is no, because the oil price outlook is clouded still by COVID-19 induced uncertainties. Second wave, vaccines, would there be a third wave? Would there be another lockdown? Those things are not just affecting Nigeria, but also the rest of the world. Uh, we are in recession. We all know that there's high inflation and unemployment is high. So more people have been pushed into poverty because of the COVID-19 and the attendant economic challenges uh, that follow. And we have businesses that are still struggling to survive uh, just to stay above, above the waters. Uh, budget deficits also mean that we have to borrow more. Borrowing more means that the cost of servicing debt uh, will be increasing. Because uh, we have challenges uh, globally, not just uh, in Nigeria or Africa, we've seen decline in foreign exchange receipts, uh, portfolio investment, foreign direct investment, our people outside Nigeria who send us money uh, regularly, uh, also many of them are struggling. So it's to be expected that that's where our remittances had also reduced. Um, heightening insecurity, protests, civil unrest also means that government has to deal with so many things, including strikes, uh, demand by different um, organizations and unions. Uh, we have the young people as well protesting, their expectation about what government has to do has to do and must do, uh, by the way. There is the sub-national and the unending call for restructuring because people want to control their resources. And then because of COVID-19, even though government revenue is less, uh, government expenditure is more. Because government has to spend the money that it does not even have to take care of people uh, and make a lot of interventions like uh, you know, what government did with the airline industry. Uh, and people will say it's not enough, but the reality is government doesn't have enough money, uh, unfortunately. So we also have the Economic Sustainability Plan uh, that addresses different aspects of the economy, including how to address the issues we are dealing with as a result of COVID-19. Uh, there's low interest regime now, which for some people is positive. It means that you can borrow now at a more affordable rate than before to do real business. But it also means that for people who have the funds to, to give out, uh, because inflation is higher than the return they are getting, their real return is negative. Uh, on the regional space and global uh, dimension, of course, regional, the most uh, significant issue uh, now is the after. 
the African continental free trade area, and then globally, Brexit, United States, and Biden as the new president are all combined uh, playing a significant role, especially uh, we expect that there will be uh, less trade tension with Biden um, coming out of the U.S., and that has implications for the rest of the world, hopefully positive. Um, then in terms of the impact uh, you know, of changes that the Finance Act has introduced on key sectors, um, I'll just go through the sectors one by one, first starting with an overview. So in terms of the general overview um, and what affects everybody, we've seen a lot of changes and, and many of us would have seen these uh, you know, on social media, on TV and all of that. But the starting point is to always focus on the policy objectives. So what, what is it that government aims to achieve? So we can then contextualize uh, the amendments within the framework of what the intentions are. So the first one is that, uh, bear in mind the, the context I gave in terms of the economy. So government wants to adopt counter-cyclical fiscal policy measures to respond to the economic and revenue challenges. Essentially, this means it's a time when individuals, households, and businesses are struggling. What can we do to help them? Uh, of course, you will not be raising taxes uh, uh, in a period like that. Uh, but it also means that your ability to give out reliefs and incentives is significantly uh, limited. So reform extend fiscal policy to prioritize job creation, economic growth, and social economic development and domestic revenue mobilization. So government still wants to raise revenue. And this is, you know, a tough question. How do you generate more revenue when you do not want to introduce new taxes and you don't want to increase the rate of existing taxes? There's only one answer to that, is to get people who were not paying before, legitimately, they were not, they were not paying what they were supposed to pay legitimately before. How can you get them to pay? And you also have to raise the question of those people also can't just be everybody. Uh, they have to be people who have the ability to pay. Because if a poor person did not pay their taxes before and now they've lost their job, it doesn't matter what loss you quote. They just don't have the money to pay you. Then provide fiscal relief for taxpayers. Uh, and then uh, we need to commend government for you know, uh, committing to the fact that there will be no new taxes and no higher rate for existing one. And I can confirm from my reading of the finance act, uh, there's no new tax and there's no higher rate for any existing taxes. Then propose measures to fund federal government COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and then ensuring coordination of fiscal, monetary, and trade policies, as well as reform to Fiscal Responsibility Act and the Public Procurement Act. So these are the policy objectives of government uh, in terms of the Finance Act 2020. So let's now see how these affect uh, specific sectors of the economy, um, starting with the general impact. Uh, this would affect everyone. It doesn't matter whether you're in aviation, whether you're in transportation or, or wherever. Some of the changes we have seen include uh, the reduction in the rates of minimum tax uh, that companies have to pay, which, which was 0.5% based on the 2019 Finance Act, uh, but has now been reduced to 0.25%. That's a 50% reduction. And so this will benefit all companies that have to pay uh, minimum tax as a result of the fact that you expect that during COVID, uh, your profit will be less or some companies will even make losses. Having to then find money to pay tax uh, is a tough thing. So we're even hoping that, you know, very soon we get to a point where government feels comfortable and that people are paying the right amount of tax and those who are not, we have means of finding out and punishing them rather than having provisions in the law that punish uh, everyone. Minimum tax is really a punishment on a company when they have not made profits. Uh, you may then find out that you have to borrow to even pay your taxes. So we're hoping that in no time, uh, this minimum tax will be removed from our law completely. Uh, there are no easy choices, like I said before, and there's no silver bullet that will solve all the problems. And government has uh, limited fiscal space for incentives and to deliver on one of the core objectives of counter-cyclical fiscal measures. Uh, so 
the deduction for COVID-19 uh, donation is also one of the ways of ensuring that people who have the ability uh, to give something for us to address COVID also get the fast relief and uh, that it deserves. So the other one that affects everyone is the, the move to improve the process for claiming tax refunds uh, in the law. So that is really a very good one. So the Accountant General now by law is to create uh, accounts for different uh, <clears throat> tax types uh, such that a budget will be made appropriated and there will be money in those accounts to pay all manner of refunds from VAT to CIT and so on and so forth. Uh, now to specific sectors, agriculture, we have the rationalization of incentives for broader sectors. So before you could be involved in agricultural trade or business and get tax incentives. And that was so wide that almost anyone and everyone can, can claim that they are doing agribusiness just by buying and selling and, you know, planting, for example. Uh, so what this law has done is to rationalize it and limit it to primary agricultural production. We also have vast exemption for animal feeds, so which means the animal feeds that you use as a farmer or someone in a Greek business, you won't have to pay VAT, as well as when you lease equipment for agri purposes. What we had before in the law was the purchase of a Greek equipment. So imagine a tractor, how many farmers can buy a tractor? If you're buying a tractor, you didn't pay that. But if you didn't have money to buy a tractor, and you were leasing it to use for agri purposes, you then have to pay VAT. So this law now has corrected that to say, well, whether you are leasing it or you are buying it, you shouldn't have to pay VAT. And then we have lower import duty now uh, for the importation of, of tractors. Then I have uh, the next sector is banking and capital markets. Um, you know, one thing that is very apparent is that the banking sector and the capital market have increased compliance obligation under the Finance Act 2020, based on amendments to the various laws. Uh, and this, for example, include the common reporting standard, where banks uh, will have to meet certain obligations of providing certain data about some of their customers and sharing that with government. And the intention is that government would, in turn, share this information even with the rest of the world, because the rest of the, rest of the world would also be sharing information with Nigeria. And this is really the era where there's really no place to hide as a taxpayer, and the only thing that is sustainable uh, that you can sleep at night, close your two eyes, and hope to have a good dream is when you do the right thing. The unclaimed funds trust fund affects both unclaimed um, dividends for listed entities uh, once it's over six years, as well as uh, dormant account balances um, also above above uh, six six years. For both of these, there are a lot of um, you know compliance requirements. Um, banks have to provide statement, report, uh, and then there will be reconciliation. Of course, there are penalties for not doing those things. So really, these are the you know the biggest uh, amendment affecting the, the banking and capital market sector. Uh, construction and real estate is next. Uh, there's an amendment to the you know in the Value Added Tax Act um, in terms of defining the time of supply. Uh, and then that time of supply is now tells you at what point a supply has been made for the purpose of VAT and therefore apply the VAT as of that date. This will be particularly important if there's a change in tax rate, VAT rate, like we had uh, under the 2019 Finance Act. And a lot of you had the question of, should I, you know, I'm sending my invoice out now, should I apply 5% or 7.5% or I sent the invoice before uh, but I haven't been paid. Or oh, I did the work, but I've never issued the invoice until now. So those questions are now being addressed. And it will particularly affect the construction sector because it's not just when you conclude the entire project. It's also based on milestones. So it could be that the time you supply uh, one part of the contract is different from when you supply the remaining component or deliver on the remaining components of the contract. Um, for real estate, uh, there's exemption of land and building from VAT, which means buying land, buying a house or a building is clearly exempted from VAT. The other um, consequential implication of that is then if I'm paying rent, because rent is the right to use a building uh, or landed property, which is itself not a taxable uh, supply, and therefore the rent you pay 
should not be liable to VAT. For real estate investment companies, they were given some tax transparent status in the Finance Act of 2019, but then there was a caveat in the law that says if you distribute 75% of your dividend and rental income, you shouldn't pay CIT, but whatever you do not distribute is liable to tax. The question is, why would you want to tax someone who had met the requirements? Uh, so this 2020 Finance Act has now corrected that um, you know, um, anomaly such that once, once a real estate investment company has met the requirements, it won't have to pay uh, tax on its dividend and rental income. Bear in mind anyway that in the exemption of recall from taxes, it's not that government is losing money. We're just saying, let it be a transparent vehicle so that the investors will be the ones to pay the taxes when they receive the income. If such income is liable to tax. Uh, so this also, in a way, would affect the capital markets uh, for RICO that are listed. So next, we have consumer and industrial products. Um, you know, some of the key changes, uh, and I've limited all of these to two bullet points just to focus on the most important uh, changes because of our time. Excise duties on imported materials and goods. Um, if you have anything that is liable to excise duty in Nigeria, and it's been imported from outside Nigeria, whether it's currently being produced in Nigeria or not, is not really relevant. So excise duty should be fully applied. And uh, that provides a level playing field. What has happened in the Finance Act 2019 was that if what you are importing was liable to excise duty, but it was not currently being produced in Nigeria, it wasn't being produced in Nigeria, then you don't pay the excise duty. So Finance Act 2020 has taken that away you pay size duty whether it's being produced in Nigeria or not to the extent that the item itself is liable to excise duty. There's the reduction of import tariff on vehicles, including those used for transportation of goods. So which means, uh, you know, companies in this sector moving their goods around uh, would uh, at least have less cost uh, than they would normally have incurred because of this reduction in tariff. Uh, software has now been recognized as a qualifying capital expenditure. So in tax, it means that this asset is recognized as a capital asset for tax purposes, and therefore you can claim capital allowances uh, on the cost. The time and place of supply rules under VAT have been defined and very well outlined, including how do you deal with periodic payment rules for VAT? So you have a periodic payment. You bought something, it's 10 million naira, but you're not paying at once. You're going to pay over a period of time. So the law has defined that your you know, time of supply is the area of when payment is made or when an invoice is issued uh, or when uh, the credit is received uh, by the supplier. So you have to look at all those benchmarks uh, of triggers of time of supply and then figure out which one applies to you. But in terms of payments, payment for VAT remains on cash basis. That amendment was introduced in 2019 Finance Act, and it hasn't been modified. So in other words, the time you actually have to part with money to pay the tax authority VAT uh, is when um, the cash payment has been received or paid, as the case may be, for input and output VAT. Then the next sector is energy and utility sector. Uh, some of the impacts that we see include the amendment to make the entities uh, in the oil and gas free zone area to start filing tax returns with the FRS. We didn't have this before. It's not to ask them to pay taxes, it's to file returns. And I think this is right because you need to know what the entities are, do are doing. In the event that you find an entity there that is not playing by the rules and is supposed to pay tax, then that way, the FRS will have visibility as to what they are doing and be able to impose tax as appropriate. Uh, gas utilization incentives have been rationalized such that you cannot claim the incentive uh, twice under any law, uh, whether it's VAT, sorry, CIT or PPT. So next is, um, okay, so the next sector is insurance industry. Um, the definition of gross income for live uh, business, as well as the definition of gross premium for non-live uh, has now been included in the law. And this is the right thing to do because 
Uh, you don't want to start taxing an insurance company on what is not really their income. When you pay premium for life in life policy, it's not an income to, to the insurance company because uh, while insurance is about risk and it may or may not happen, when it comes to life, it's certain that all of us will die. So the only uncertainty is when. So you cannot consider the premium you pay as an income to the insurance company. Therefore, asking them to pay tax in any means by any disguise uh, on that amount will not be fair. So this has not been properly defined. And then we had uh, an amendment to the 2019 uh, Finance Act uh, to CETA uh, via the 2019 Finance Act that took away the ability of people to deduct the premium they pay on their lives and the life of their spouses uh, for tax purposes. Uh, so that has now been restored, which means if you buy a life policy now or a contract of annuity, the premium you pay is tax deductible. Insurance companies also are required to report under the common reporting standards similar to what banks uh, are supposed to do. So the next sector is uh, non-resident multinationals and the digital economy. Uh, we have expanded tax compliance obligation for non-resident uh, uh, companies doing business with Nigeria. They don't have to be in Nigeria. Uh, particularly with respect to VAT and in terms of the significant economic presence rules for companies in contact. Essentially, it means that uh, the threshold for you to become liable to paying taxes in Nigeria as a non-resident person doing business with Nigeria has been reduced so that it's almost like, you know, for the Naira equivalent that you make, you become liable to, to company income tax in Nigeria. Uh, but those non-resident multinationals can also appoint uh, fiscal representatives. Uh, we also have the introduction of the significant economic presence rules under the personal income tax. We didn't have it before. What we had was just for companies. Now we have for, uh, for individuals as well. So if I can just move this again. Okay, I think as we wait for this, uh, some of the other sectors that are equally going to be impacted uh, include the public sector. Uh, so, and in terms of the public sector, we have now uh, introduction of rules around fiscal uh, responsibility to ensure that there's transparency uh, in what um, we're doing in the public sector. And that transparency includes ensuring that uh, there's even fiscal uh, discipline. The ratio of the cost to revenue uh, for MDAs uh, is now capped at 50%, which means you can't just spend all the money that you generate. And there are provisions for quarterly reconciliation and reporting uh, where that is not done. For the uh, Public uh, Procurement Act, the scope of the law has now been clearly defined to include all arms of government. So it's not only the executive arm, so even the National Assembly, as well as the judiciary, are also required to comply with the provision of the procurement uh, act. So the whole idea is that by government becoming more efficient, we can see some savings, uh, given that our money or resources, let me call it resources that we have, uh, are quite limited. So uh, now that I have the slides coming up, uh, transportation, uh, VAT exemption for flight tickets, uh, flight tickets are exempted, duty waiver for commercial aircraft, parts and components of those aircraft, as well as reduction of, of uh, import duty uh, for vehicles. And this is really important to clarify. So for new vehicles, new cars, it's only the levy that has been reduced from 35 to 5. The import duty of 35% is still applicable on new and uh, used uh, cars. So which means for a new car, uh, the total tariff you pay on import is 40%. Uh, because there's a lot of reaction as to whether this goes against the government uh, auto policy. Uh, some of us think that 40% is still high enough to encourage people to buy locally. And then the rules for foreign airlines and shipping companies in terms of their taxation on their companies in contact, as well as capital gains tax, have been clarified. And then in some cases, we'd say have been rationalized. For small businesses, they are exempted. Uh, from preparing audited accounts based on guidelines to be issued by the FRS. And this is really to align 
the provision of CETA with that of the Companies and Allied Matters Act 2020 that now exempts small businesses from preparing audited accounts. So why should they ask them to prepare it for tax purposes? Around the world, what you find is you don't want to overburden small businesses with, with audits because audits can be expensive. Most times, it doesn't add a lot of value to them. And they can, you know, be discouraged from even formalizing their businesses and they remain, you know, enterprises or sole traders. So we also have specific exemption from education tasks for small companies. I've already spoken to public sector, uh, so I'll just move on now and conclude uh, talking about impact on individuals and employers of labor. The exemption of minimum wage earners, currently 30,000 or less from personal income tax, also means that they don't need to be uh, you know, to suffer PAYE deduction on a monthly basis. The consolidated relief allowance has been redefined. So to exclude anything that is exempted from tax, in principle, it means there's no item in your tax competition for personal income tax that will enjoy relief of more than 100%. So what this means is if you are not any minimum weight, 30,000 or less, you will see a slight increase in your PAYE uh, going forward from January. Withholding obligation has been placed on employers when they pay compensation for loss of employment uh, to deduct withholding tax uh, by way of capital gain tax at 10% if the amount on any amount over 10 million. In other words, if you pay 15 million for someone who has lost their employment, you deduct 10% on the 5 million uh, over and above 10 million. So to close, um, I will then quickly speak about Stakeholders' prospect, we conducted a study uh, which many of you on this call would have completed. So hopefully these slides can move quickly. So we ask um, participants registering for this event to share their thoughts on the Finance Act. And these were the responses we got. First, we had over 800 people responded, uh, mostly CEOs. Uh, executive directors, business owners, but also we have tax function leaders uh, representing multinationals, large companies, SMEs, and NGOs. All sectors, all key sectors are covered uh, of the economy. So we ask uh, you know, people about what are the top three changes they're most excited about. And this is what we got. Um, the number one for people is reduction of the minimum tax rate from 0.5% to 0.25%. And then uh, we also have another one, which is the use of email to correspond with the FRS. Uh, given that there's COVID, nobody wants to go fiscally to the tax office. And then number three um, is to do with um, deployment of technology by FRS for task compliance monitoring. So the ability of the task authority to ensure that people are paying the right amount of tax. What are the top three things people disagree with? Uh, number one is unclaimed fund, trust fund, uh, in terms of unclaimed dividend and dormant bank account. Uh, and then the plan to introduce exercise duty on telecommunication. And then even though this looks like a contradiction, a number of people, uh, about 28%, uh, disagree with the deployment of technology by the FRS for tax compliance monitoring, especially if that would involve plugging into uh, the systems of taxpayers. Then we ask people, where do you think government should find uh, money, given that there's no money? Uh, and then number one thing is people said government should use technology to cash evaders, okay? So even though they're not very pleased for FRS to plug into their system. And then public procurement efficiency and fiscal discipline. And the last one is to tax foreign companies using the significant economic presence order. So in terms of the impact that businesses have had around COVID-19 and how they think the response from government is effective, these are the responses we got. Overall, um, more people think that government has done their best, uh, but then they think in terms of impact, only about um, 38% think that there's any impact on their business from what government has done. 51% uh, don't think there's any impact in any way, negative or positive. 
and about 11% disagree, uh, 1% strongly disagree. Then we ask uh, participants about uh, overall, do they support the finance act? And it was a terms of uh, a significant 92% of respondents are in support of the finance act 2020. Uh, so this is a very good and high pass mark. My recollection is this is even higher than what we had for the finance act 2019. So my closing talk uh, is to say that governments will be impacted tax authorities will be impacted, individuals and businesses will be impacted, so also our tax professionals, particularly those who are agents and need to help uh, companies and businesses comply. My closing thought is, you know, Abraham Lincoln's quote of the best way to predict the future is to, to create it. So we can complain, but that won't solve our problems, but we should find a way to play our part individually and collectively what, using whatever platforms we have and hopefully we can have uh, a better country that we're all proud of. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim, for that very insightful presentation. Um, so you did justice to it. It's very difficult to um, to compress all the all of the amendments which was done through the Finance Act 2020. Um, but I think you we did an excellent job job of summarizing it. Um, we bringing out the salient issues. Um, as well as the insights from um, the survey or the feedback gotten from um, people um, shows that, you know, you know, government could be looking into certain directions. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to mention is that you can, if you have a question for a particular panelist, please do not forget that you can put your questions in the Q and A box um, that has been set up um, on this platform. So you, if you look at your bottom right, if you're joining with your laptop, you see Q and A just there. You click on it um, and and you ask your questions. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that you know PwC has done an insight um, series across the various sectors, um, which would which is already, I think, available on our website, which analyzes the changes that have been brought about by the Finance Act um, on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, um, as well as the key issues impacting on um, employers with regards to their employees. So, um, you, you may find that useful in terms of um, um, just getting an initial um, perspective of the impact on your industry or on your company. Um, so at this time, I cannot see Dr. Bode, but you know, at this time, we'll be going into the panelist session um, and to do the introductions um, for that session and to moderate the session is um, Andrew Nevin, who I introduced to you before and actually um, did the economic outlook for 2021. So over to you, Andrew, to handle the panel session. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, I'm sorry, it was like many of these things in this uh, new world, it's not so new anymore. There's a little bit of cha challenge on this. Um, we were supposed to have Dr. Bode Oyotunde, who's the Special Senior Advisor to the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget and Planning um, with us. Um, I, I think we've lost Dr. Bode for a minute. Um, I'm hoping we now have Dr. Sarah Alade on the panel. Um, Dr. Alade, of course, is also Senior Special Assistant to the, the Minister, Honorable Minister. But prior to that, of course, she was the Deputy Governor of the uh, CBN, um, and just a very, very accomplished and, and powerful woman woman in Nigeria. Well, no, I mean, she doesn't need an introduction. Um, Dr. Aladdin, can you hear me? Am I able to call on you to make a few remarks? As you're aware, we don't, the, the video that the Honorable Minister prepared, we have um, not been able to upload in the right format. And I'm going to call on you if you are willing to, to make a few remarks and, uh, on behalf of the minister. Hello. Dr. Andrew, Aladdin, can you hear me? We can hear you very well, Dr. Ladd. Are you prepared? I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that, but this is the new world. Are you able to speak for a few minutes on behalf of the minister? 
Well, well, I thought she had made the welcome remark, but I want to thank PwC on behalf of the minister for um, for this opportunity. It's uh, very educating, and I'm sure many people who are watching will be, you know, better. Will have better understanding of what the Finance Act has uh, twenty. Uh, and uh, I, I have also. Uh, I also want to thank Taiwo, especially for doing a good job at exposing it. So I I wish everyone a very uh, fruitful uh, deliberation. Well, we listen to questions, we listen to the interactions from the public so that we will also have lessons to learn from some of the questions that we posed. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you, Dr. Alada. I'm going to come back to you with a, a question or two on, on our panel here. So just to, to introduce the rest of our panel, as, as I said before, we've got the, the remarkable Amal Hassan, who's the CEO of Outsource Global, which is the leading uh, BPO company in Nigeria. Amal Hassan, her company, exports uh, Nigerian brains without anyone leaving Nigeria. And 50% of her uh, people are, are women. Um, she has offices in um uh, Kaduna and Abuja, and I think she's opening somewhere else that she can mention on that. Um, Amal, can you hear me? Amal, are you on mute? Say hello, please. Yes, I am. <laughs> oh, very good to hear from you. Okay, I'll come back to you with a question or, or some comments very shortly on that. We've also got uh, Mr. Sam Ronzi, who's the uh, Chief Financial Officer of Harris Holdings Oil and Gas Company. And prior to that, he was the uh, Chief Investment Officer of Harris Holdings. Um, Sam, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Andrew. Delightful. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. No, delightful to have you. And uh, we're hoping we get Dr. Bode back. I'm just looking at my other screen on that, if he comes back. And of course, Taiwo is also part of the uh, the panel today. So I'm gonna start with um, Amal and Sam and ask each of you to just spend you know two to three minutes kind of um, giving some, some overall thoughts to what you've heard this morning. And then we'll go into some specific uh, questions that we've prepared. And then after our questions, Kenneth will take over. We'll take the questions from the audience. So, Amal, just two or three minutes on your on your thoughts from what you've heard this morning. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, the finance, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's really an honor to be talking to everyone today. The Finance Act is really, the new Finance Act is really very important, especially to SMEs. And one of the things that I, after listening to today's uh, uh, session, is there needs to be a more creation of awareness, you know, for young entrepreneurs. A lot of people are a bit confused, and I'm, I'm even clearer listening to today's remar um, remark. And I think by the time that a lot of cre um, awareness is is created, a lot of people will have a better understanding of it. And this is a step in the right direction. So um, uh, I'm going to stop here. A bit. Okay, I'll come back to you, um, Amal, with some specific questions. Sam, just some opening remarks on what you've heard this morning. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, and thanks a lot, Taiwo, for um, helping to make that simple. You know, Taiwo has this thing of making things that are complex very simple. Um, First of all, I'll say I think I'm one of those people in the respondents that gave the Finance Act a, a thumbs up. I think if I had the opportunity, I would have given it a double thumbs up. Um, first is because I think uh, it's very, very progressive. Uh, when I look at how our fiscal policy has developed over the years, I think this approach by the government is um, very, very instructive. The second thing is it's clearly it's clear that it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act that is targeted at reforms. And th those reforms, are, um, I think, is hitting the right nails um, that are important in solidifying the economy on a going for on a go forward basis. I, I, when the first one came out in 2019, we were all uh, quite happy, blown away with the things that got in there. And I think the 2020 Finance Act is consolidating on some of the things that we already uh, we have in the 2019 one. And then the second thing I will mention is it's a good enabler for the um, the budget and uh, the kind of plans that I think the government may have going forward. There are a couple of areas that need some clarification, uh, like Ty would rightly mentioned, and some guidance, which I expect will be released as we go along. But my general view is that um, it's, a very good, it's a very good development for the economy. 
Okay, Sam, let me just stick with you for uh, one moment here and ask you a specific question. So, um, and you, you heard my presentation where I talked about the lack of investment and the fact if we don't get it up till that 26 to 29 percent, we'll continue to to grow less than population. So, at a time when, sorry, I'm looking, I've got multiple screens here, just you know, these questions, I want to get the question exactly right. At a time when many investors seem to be holding back on investment, not just in Nigeria, but across the world, Ayers Holding is doing the opposite with various additions to your investment portfolio. What is driving this optimism? Or is there something that you guys are seeing that others are not? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so um, I'll start by saying, um, Hairs Holdings as an investment company is a long-term investment company. The way we see investments, we look at it from a long-term point of view. And because of that, we are not easily moved by uh, short-term uh, volatility you find in circles but we focus our investment philosophy around the fundamentals. If you look at the fundamentals of the Nigerian or the African economy, I think the fundamentals still remain strong. We have a very strong demographic um, in terms of what you see there. We've seen that the government is doing, moving in the right direction uh, as it relates to uh, enabling policies to help kick off uh, or get the economy going, part of which you mentioned when you were doing your uh, presentation. Uh, but part of the thing that is driving a lot of the things we've done in the last couple of months relates to the energy gap. Um, mm. As an investment company, there are two things that drive the things we invest. Number one is we want to generate commercial return for providers of capital. But the secondly, which is equally important for us, is we want to create developmental impact, social impact. Because we think in Africa, if you are going to invest for growth, you have to think of both sides of the coin. And um, we, we believe that investing in certain sectors or certain areas that are fundamental to driving the growth of the African economy is extremely important. So this, this fundamental approach is what guides us, is what is pushing us as a group uh, to make investments even when people uh, are not really keen on doing it. Because we see it in the long term, we think things are moving in the, in the right direction. And we also believe that at a time like this, assets are usually undervalued. And as an investment professional, you want to go in where you think you have that opportunity. Wow, fantastic. I hope everyone is, is listening. I mean, one of the things that we say is, uh, I mean, I lived for a decade in China. I saw what people say is the greatest economic transformation in history. I actually think Africa will be even a greater economic transformation, and Nigeria is the biggest part of that. So thank you, Sam, and everything you're doing there to be Part of that story. Amal, I want to come back to you with a question before I go on to Taiwo and, and I hope back to Dr. Abade. Amal, so, excuse me, our survey findings show that many businesses are excited about being able to exchange official communications with the FIRS using email and other electronic means. They also raised the use of technology to catch tax evaders as a number one strategy this government can use to generate revenue. What are your thoughts as someone that runs what is essentially a technology company? What are your thoughts on the increasing role of technology in the Nigerian economy? Thank you very much. I think I think technology is what will drive growth in Nigeria. And uh, it is really what we're doing with FRS and what FRS has done is really a step in the right direction in the sense that there will be more transparency, there will be, there will be more efficiency in terms of dealing with FRS. A lot of people, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of young entrepreneurs are really confused on what is even the tax to pay. And, and providing that channel uh, has actually provided a platform for them to do that. Like you mentioned, uh, like I mentioned earlier, using technology in Nigeria is what will actually drive uh, the growth in, in, in the economy in terms of, uh, one, efficiency, in terms of increasing revenue, in terms of accountability. I always mention that Nigerians will always work with the system. If there is no system, uh, people in general, even around the world, would not do what they need to do in terms of dealing with the government, in terms of paying tax. But once there's a system, Nigerians will comply. A lot of people ask me how I'm able to put Nigerians to work for the U.S. market. 
I always tell them because there's the technology that we put in, in place brings about transparency. And that transparency is what, what makes people to work knowing that whatever you do, you're accountable for it. And that brings accountability. And the moment there is accountability and transparency, everything will change. So I, I can give you an example with um, um, FRS is one example. And I think if we use what we have done with FRS and try to use it to aggregate data for, for economic growth, it, it will really be improved on even now. So using the emails to, to create awareness with SMEs, having that data available to FRS will actually allow them to communicate every communication to every SME because they have that on their database. And I think that's, that's really is going to, we're going to see a systemic change, you know, in, in the growth of, uh, of, of in, um, in, in, in the net tax that SMEs are, are, are contributing to, to, uh, to Nigeria. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amal, for that. Sorry, Do Dr. Lani, may, may I add you one question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so, I mean, Nigeria is a complex nation and it just is a, a tough job for anyone to manage the economy, even in normal times. But today we're literally at war with uh, COVID. We all know the complications of that. So of all the economic challenges the country faces, what really keeps people up at the Minister, Ministry of Finance? Uh, uh, thank you, Andrew. I think, um, well, the minister is not here to tell us, but I know for sure one thing that will be keeping her awake will be the revenue situation in the country. We have so much. You're talking about COVID. There's health challenges. We have security issues. We have lack of infrastructure. Very many things that will require funding. But the revenue is just uh, very low, absolutely low. And I know that that's one thing that, uh, you know, that keeps her on her toes and that keeps her awake at night. It's not as if, I mean, with the oil revenue, the only products that we have are going low. We have come from a budget of, uh, we had made a budget of uh, $28 last year. This year, 2021, we are hoping that it will be, I mean, if the budget is based on $40 barrel, and we are hoping that there will be, nothing will happen to, to make it uh, go below that. But even at $40 per barrel, we have a deficit of uh, over $5 billion. I mean, 5 billion naira, uh, trillion naira. So with that kind of deficit, which is, uh, I mean, to, to finance, Definitely, the minister cannot go to sleep with her two eyes open. Yes, we are doing, just uh, before I leave, we're doing uh, a lot of things. We have the Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative, which the ministry has embarked on, trying to rake in revenue, not, ne not necessarily from oil, but uh, from other sources, trying to improve compliance for taxes and uh, make tax administration you know, easier and more efficient so that uh, more revenue can come in. But it's just one thing that is top priority in the ministry and on the minister's list. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alada. I think uh, everyone on this uh, session and everyone across the country appreciates the how challenging it is to be the economic stewards of the country. And we all appreciate the minister's efforts, the honorable minister's efforts and your efforts and Dr. the entire team there. It's just, it's not an easy job um, what you're doing. And thank you for that. Um, Taiwo, let me, let me come back to you. So um, yeah, it was really interesting listening to the survey results and just to see such a positive reaction to, to the direction that the government, the minister of finance and budget planning is, is taking us with the finance act. So many taxpayers are excited about the reduction of the minimum tax rate for companies voted as the number one most like reform um, in the the Finance Act by by our survey. So, what's your your take on that? Can you expand a bit more on that? Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so, the this is one of the biggest um, challenges with our tax system, and it's been with us for decades. 
um, for a number of years, um, if we just remind ourselves that until the final tax of 2019, we didn't have any major reforms to our tax laws in 20 years. So this minimum tax rule before would ask you to pay tax at all times, whether you made a profit or you made a small profit or whether you're even loss making and you're borrowing to pay salaries based on some parameters, including your turnover, your share capital, your total asset. In fact, it was, was almost like if you were investing heavily in a capital intensive industry, like power generation, right? That you're not going to make money in the next five years. Because of the size of your investment in assets, you were meant to pay a lot of money in minimum tax every year to government. So this was really uh, anti-business and counterproductive. So in 2019, the finance act amended the company income tax to say, well, don't pay tax based on these other things like assets and, and uh, gross profits. You should pay it only based on turnover. And the, the rate was um, set at 0.5%. But it turns out that even 0.5% of turnover was uh, still very high, particularly for sectors where you have high volume in terms of turnover, but very low margin. A, a good example is petroleum marketing uh, companies. And uh, so we actually had data showing that some of these companies paid more in minimum tax, uh, being 0.5% of turnover, than their own profits on the business. So clearly that, that's not a way to continue in business if you don't want companies to go on that. So what then happened was government listened to those uh, feedback and now has reduced the minimum tax rate from 0.5% of turnover to 0.25%. Uh, we all understand that it's a difficult time. There's COVID, the government does not have enough money. Uh, but then uh, I'm really very optimistic that over the next few years, we're going to have further reform to this minimum tax so that people only pay taxes uh, on their profits. And I think this was one of the points that... Uh, uh, Mr. Akimu Biadeshino made uh, while presenting during the national dialogue um, you know, last week. And to simply say any law, and this is established around the world, any law that makes you pay tax on turnover rather than on your profit is not good for investment. So we are optimistic that this reform uh, will be seen to the end. Uh, currently, the Finance Act 2020 says you only enjoy this reduction for two years. Uh, if we get to, you know, 2022 and Nigeria is growing at 15% GDP and there's money everywhere, maybe we can then sustain it. Otherwise, uh, further reform will be required. Thank you, Taiwo, for that. So let me let me come to um, Sam for another question here. So 75% so of our respondents said their businesses have suffered declines as a result of uh, COVID. And 35% have seen significant declines. Can you share with us the experience of Ayers Holdings and the lessons from your management through the, the economic crisis? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I mean, when uh, COVID hit us uh, last year, um, a couple of businesses in our portfolios did suffer, uh, particularly our hospitality business. Uh, in Hairs Holdings, we, we invest in several sectors, and one of our big big sectors is in the hospitality space. The hospitality, the hospitality business was um, clearly impacted. Um, but a couple of things I will share, uh, some of the things we did uh, that kind of put us very quickly on a, on a different from the advice uh, most companies. And even these uh, points I'm going to raise are not necessarily um, just because just when you go through a crisis, but we've come to understand they've become the new norm in terms of how you look at your businesses and manage them. So number one is the big advice is every business should learn how to pivot. Um, it doesn't, uh, the world we live in is so dynamic, uh, moves at a very rapid pace that uh, a strategy you choose to run with uh, two months ago may be obsolete, you know, uh, even, you know two months after. Uh, and so you have to organize your, your, your organization and your system in a way and manner that you can pivot very easily. Flexibility is extremely important in your ability to be able to manage businesses today. The second thing I would mention is always focus on the cash. You know, um, a lot of uh, business businesses, um, or, or people like to talk about the profits that they make. Um, but as we know, um, profits is usually is, is an accounting is an accounting term, right? 
what the business really survives on is cash. If you run out of cash, you run out of business. And so active and effective cash management was one of the important tools that we immediately deployed as a group on all our businesses the moment we started seeing a change. And I think it helped to adjust the way the businesses were able to wade through some of the challenges. And it's, it's now clear that that should be the norm in terms of how you run a business in the kind of world that we evolve in, effective cash management. And then the third thing I would mention, and this is particular for us uh, as, a, you know, as an investment company, is diversification. Yeah? Always think of ways to diversify. Mm. Uh, to diversify your portfolio, your earning streams, you know, the, 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 the different markets that you earn from. You know, most, many, many businesses usually have, uh, you know, a, a single source or two or three customers that form the bedrock of a lot of what they earn. Um, if you're going to survive or grow, um, you know, in, uh, in uh, what we notice in this world, you have to learn to diversify. Um, both in terms of your market approach, in terms of your revenue sources, uh, your revenue base, your customer base. Um, you have to think diversification in everything that you do. So th those would be some of the things that I would mention that I think we kind of applied. Uh, of course, there are a lot more things that we had to do which are specific to different businesses, but this would be some general okay. terms that I think would be important. Sam, no, thank you very much for that. And I think it's interesting, the last point about the diversification. I mean, one of the things we've learned from the COVID crisis is how, how much our society around the world lacked resilience. And there's going to be a lot more thinking about what resilience actually actually means. And part of that, of course, is having you know multiple paths on that. So, Amal, I want to come to you with a, a slightly different question. I mean, you've built a business in northern Nigeria. Um, we all know that we need uh, inclusive, sustainable development across the country, but we particularly needed the North. And maybe you could just comment a little bit on your view on that and maybe how the Finance Act and what the federal government is doing um, may, may contribute to the development of Northern Nigeria. Thank there you. we go. You're on mute. Uh, go ahead, please. <laughs> I think they keep on muting me on me, uh, without me knowing, so I keep on thinking the system is open. Yes, there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, just to give a bit of a background, the reason why I started Outsource was I looked at the way the northern Nigeria is and look, tried to see how what we can do to create employment <laughs> in Nigeria. I feel that if we focus on and and my my our basic focus was uh, I looked at the way the the north is there are a lot of uneducated people but even the educated people that put themselves through school is not just northern Nigeria it's across Nigeria the after going through education they can get employed so I decided to set up outsource to actually impact on that. And one of the things Nigeria needs to do is one, look at the one area. We graduate a million graduate. I keep on saying that in almost every time I speak and it beats me all the time that a lot of people put themselves through school. So there's a lot of, uh, there's lack of education in the North and uh, more, more in the North than in other areas. But the people that have gone through the stress of putting themselves through school, they come out uneducated and, be, uh, and after uh, they, they come out without employment. And if the government can focus on creation of employment in Nigeria, a lot will change. So and SMEs are the most, the largest untapped segment that would be able to provide that. So with the Finance Act, with what we have done today, I've been saying is a step in the right direction to grow SMEs. SMEs are the ones that will create employment, are the ones that will create employment to the ones that are educated, are the ones that are not educated. So, so, so if we focus on that, growing the SME sector, growing <laughs> that sector would actually... Uh, 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 create a lot of employment in the north. The Wow, thank you for that, Amal. I mean, again, we sort of see, as I said a little earlier, we we're talking about brain capital and Nigeria's greatest export is, is brains. And that is something that we have in abundance. And of course, their highest value added, much higher value added in oil. 
So, Dr. Alada, I just want to ask you a quick question to close off the panel, if I may. Dr. Alada, are you still with us? Yes, I am. So, we've talked a bit today about the subnational levels of government, and in principle, they're closer to the people. So, I we're curious how much cooperation is the federal government getting from the states and the um, LGAs to make sure that all the interventions are really coordinated in a powerful way? Um, I. I... I'll say that um, the cooperation has been good. And uh, when it comes to things like COVID-19, for instance, you cannot say that you are treating federal staff or federal people and not everybody, you know, is involved. So there has been cooperation. Even in the making of the finance uh, 2020, there's a lot of consultations with uh, states uh, government. Uh, in many other areas, um, part of the on the medium term plan, there's been a lot of cooperation with states in terms of, uh, you know, planning the plan so that we have a, um, a one plan where we are working in the same direction with state government. So there has been a well, well, thank you, Dr. Alade. That's it is very um, uh, you know wonderful to hear. I mean, as we said a little earlier, we need development every part of of this nation. It's great to hear that the states are working well with the federal government. So I'm going to turn it over to Tai Wo at this point. I, I think we may be able to show uh, the Honorable Minister's video. I think we've uh, solved some of the challenges with that. Tai Wo, can I turn turn the control over to you? Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much, Andrew. So what we're going to do is just improvise. Um, so we're going to play the video that the Honorable Minister had recorded because she knew she was going to be traveling and she wasn't sure about the quality of the internet. So she recorded this and uh, she kindly recorded it. Uh, so I'm going to play it now for us to listen to her directly. Good morning. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me start by wishing everybody a safe and fruitful 2021 and also by apologizing for not being personally at the event and instead sending a recording. I'm delighted to deliver this keynote address at the round table organized by PwC. I want to thank PwC Nigeria for bringing together business leaders and other critical stakeholders to discuss the light in and provide useful feedback on the Finance Act and the broader Nigerian economy. As you are aware, the COVID-19 pandemic triggered an economic downturn across most economies of the world. By the end of 2020, the world's economy fell into recession, with a contraction estimated at 3.5%, compared to global growth of 2.8% in 2019. Subsequently, the Nigerian economy was also impacted by the pandemic, reflected by the contraction in economic growth in the second and third quarters of 2020. Economic activities in the country are recovering gradually, reflected by the reduced contraction of 3.6% in the third quarter of 2020, compared to the contraction of 3.1% in the second quarter of 2020. According to the IMF, the global economy is projected to grow by 5.5% in 2021. The international financial institution has forecasted that the Nigerian economy will rebound from the estimated contraction of 3.2% in 2020 to a growth of 1.5% in 2021. The National Bureau of Statistics projects a higher growth for Nigeria at 3% by the end of the year 2021. In line with this projection, the consistent and commitment focus of government is to accelerate economic recovery from recession and return our country to diversified 
sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Given the impact of the pandemic on the domestic economy, there is a clear need for proactive implementation of macroeconomic strategies that would support domestic revenue mobilization, enhance investment flow, stimulate jobs creation, and restore the economy on the path of sustainable, diversified, and inclusive growth. Tradition. Established with the Finance Act of 2019, the federal government proposed and passed the Finance Act 2020 to support the 2021 federal budget. The 2021 budget of economic recovery and resilience by stimulating growth and providing government with the right physical position. The Act took effect on 1st of January 2021. Alongside the Appropriation Act of 2021, essentially, the Finance Act 2020 is structured across five broad thematic areas. The first one being enacting counter cyclical measures and crisis prevention initiatives. The second being introducing broad based tax and fiscal reforms. And third, implementing key public procurement reforms. Number four, providing fiscal relief targeted at key mass. Uh, trans, uh, ma uh, at key sectors such as the mass transit for mass transit, transportation, as well as the minimum wage earners. And then number five, ensuring closer coordination between monetary, fiscal, and trade authorities across ongoing uh, sectors, emphasizing the ease of doing business and other key sectoral reforms. It is important that the Finance Act 2020 consolidates on the fiscal reforms introduced by the Finance Act 2019, but does not propose any new taxes or increases any existing taxes. The Act has introduced 80 changes to about 14 different tax laws, including the company income tax, the capital gains tax, stamp duties, Oil and Gas Export Pre-Zone Act, Customs and Excise Tariff Act, and also the Value Added Tax, amongst others. Some of the provisions of the Finance Act 2020 are to consolidate on tax incentives in the, provided in the Finance Act 2019, which was targeted at stimulating micro, small, and medium enterprises given the role they played in employment generation and output growth. For instance, in the Finance Act 2020, the Act has extended the corporate income tax exemption in the Finance Act 2019 for micro and small size enterprises with a turnover of 25 million naira and below or less to include exemption from paid tertiary education tax. Also, small and medium enterprises that are engaged in primary agricultural production can now acquire pioneer status relief for an initial period of four years and an additional period of two years, making a total of six years. Other provisions of the Finance Act 2020 include one, exemption of all low-income employees who earn the minimum wage from personal income tax. Two, a 50% reduction in the minimum tax levied on companies from 0.5% to 0.25% of gross turnover, less franked investment income. Three, reduction of import duty on tractors from 35% to 5%, mass transit vehicles from for the transport of more than 10 persons and trucks from 35% to 10%. And the reduction of import DT, import levy, I beg your pardon, on cars from 30% to 35%. So there's still an import duty of 35% on cars. Exemption of commercial airline tickets, commercial aircraft spare parts, animal feeds, rental or lease of agricultural equipment for agricultural production purposes from VAT. There are also 
a lot more exemptions for VAT in the Finance Acts 2019 and 2020. Other reforms in the 2020 Finance Act are targeted at supporting the implementation of the 2021 budget. This includes restrictions on the cost to revenue ratios of government owned enterprises to increase operating surpluses remittances to the Treasury. Reforms extended also to the Procurement Act for the first time to cover the judiciary and the National Assembly, as well as shortening the procurement periods, increasing procurement mobilization fee thresholds from 15% to 30%, and providing for e-procurement. We intend to judiciously utilize our available resources to implement the 2021 budget to boost infrastructural development, restore growth, and improve the general economic well-being of Nigerians. As I conclude, I want to assure you all that the federal government of Nigeria will continue to champion economic policies aimed at improving revenue generation, enhancing economic competitiveness, encouraging domestic investors, and enhancing overall microeconomic stability despite the significant challenges posed by COVID-19 pandemic. This administration is committed to stimulating economic growth by fostering economic resilience in our business communities and the broader economy in line with the thematic thrust of 2020 and 2021 budgets. I want to also add that the federal government is forging stronger collaboration with the subnational governments, with the state governments, as well as with the local governments. I look forward to receiving the communique of this roundtable table in due course, and I do apologize for not being able to physically be with you today during this roundtable. Thank you very much for attending this event, and thank you very much again to PwC, the whole team, uh, Mr. Tayo, you, you started this all for the whole of PwC. We really appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Finance Act 2020 as well as the state of the Nigerian economy. As I leave you, I want to assure you that I have my colleagues, Dr. Sarah Lade and Dr. Bode Oyechunde, who will be standing by to participate in the panel discussions and the question and answer sessions. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, um, and the Honorable Minister is not with us, but that is a, a very powerful statement and we really appreciate, and Dr. Lade and Dr. Bode, um, thank you so much for, for being part of it today. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Kenneth. Uh, we promised a little bit earlier that we would uh, take some questions that we would give to the panel. So the panelists are still still with us and Kenneth is the uh, wonderful moderator of the audience questions for the panel. Kenneth. Thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you very much to the panelists for um, that contribution. Um, but your job is not over. We may be um, directing some of the questions to you um, as is appropriate. Um, so the first question, um, just to dive into it, because we, we have um, over 20 questions um, and we aim to end at 12. So we, we'll do as um, much as we can within the short time. So the first question I have here is directed to Taiwo. Since the requirement for MSMEs no longer requiring to deliver audited accounts, uh, what impact would it have on being able to access credit? Would they still have to submit those accounts um, or would they be exempted from submitting accounts if they want to get a loan from, from the bank? Um, you know, um, which accounts are we talking about? Over to you, Tyler. Thank you very much, uh, Ken. Uh, that's a very excellent question. And a lot of people have been really asking about what does this mean? Uh, in terms of getting credit, reliability of financial statements, and also, of course, there are people who are concerned that this could mean that some accountants would not have jobs um, to do anymore uh, once uh, these people do not have prepare accounts. So I think the short answer to it is that 
for financial institutions such as banks uh, who are granting you know, credit, what they really want is they just want the comfort that the information they're using is reliable. And you would imagine what happens today to an enterprise that is not registered with CAC and therefore does not have a compulsory requirement to audit their financial statements. Are they not getting credit? So banks can get comfortable uh, with or without audited accounts to the extent that they are able to advance credit. Sometimes uh, banks pay more attention to your cash flow projections, the pattern of what you've been doing in the past. Are you credit worthy? Do you have collateral if it's applicable? It's not like financial statement is the main thing uh, for giving those accounts. And I think for accountants who audit small companies, I actually think that the opportunities for them now are better uh, under the Finance Act 2020. Because in my view, what that means is you can now go to a small business owner and say, oh, guy, you don't even need to pay tax. Why? Because the law has exempted you from tax. But the losses you must file returns. So now the guy knows that he's only paying you to prepare the account. You must prepare account before you can file returns. I'm preparing the account for you. They're not audited, but you still have to pay me anyway. And then I file the returns on your behalf. What would then happen also is these business owners, small business owners, are more willing to be honest with you. So before many of them will say, my turnover is 10 million, but I beg, say the thing at 2 million because they don't want to pay tax. Now, because they are honest with you, knowing that they're not paying taxes means you don't identify opportunities to help them in terms of business management capacity, managing treasury, managing liquidity, and so on. So this is the way I'll put it. Uh, remember also that this is to align with KAMA. KAMA is really the overriding law in terms of requirement to prepare financial statement. Even the Financial Reporting Council Act derives its authority uh, from, from KAMA. So that would be my response to that question. Okay. Thank you very much, Taiwo. Uh, I'll go over to the next question, which I will direct to um, Amal and um, Andrew, if Andrew has um, comment. What impact will human capital migration have on the Nigerian economy in the nearest future. Um, so I guess what, where this person is coming from is we're, we're seeing a lot of emigration out of Nigeria to other countries. Um, what impact would it have and how can we even um, stop that and look at the model um, where we are actually exporting expertise rather than exporting people? Okay, <laughs> let me take that. I think uh, I think people migrate or humans migrate uh, from Nigeria for for employment for better living, right? And that's one of the things our company is addressing. If there is a way that government can promote BP or business process outsourcing, then people will remain in Nigeria and be employed outside Nigeria. I just mentioned uh, uh, earlier that we have. We graduate from 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 the status, uh, from the speech of Ngozi Kwenje Ewela at one time. She said, "We graduate a million graduates every year, and every year we have lawyers, we have accountants, we have software developers. If there's a way that we can outsource their service uh, while they they remain in Nigeria." And they still pay personal income tax, you, you know, and still grow the Nigerian economy. And that's what we are doing today. We take lawyers and they work under senior lawyers in the U.S. to solve actual U.S. cases. We take accountants and they work under senior accountants to uh, to provide financial services. So if there's a way that the government can look at creating an avenue where this the this human capital that is very good and people are, and and are not valued within the country because there aren't enough companies to actually outsource that uh, i mean that there aren't enough companies to employ that and the second the second uh, way of solving that issue is promoting smes we have a lot of smes we have a lot of young entrepreneurs springing up now there there are a lot of incentives for those smes how do we create a lot of awareness where they can tap into these incentives and grow. There's a lot of fund that is available for them to grow. If we are focused on those SMEs that have taken their businesses off the ground and are ready to, to grow, we can actually grow them so that they can tap and employ 
more people, which will bring stability in the country. The effect of people moving outside Nigeria is really, of course, a lot of them send back money home, but it means we are losing those talents. They're even changing their nationalities. They are now, I know that uh, a lot of tech companies in Nigeria, even the smaller tech companies have lost a lot of IT people to Canada this last year, last two years. And that is very, very bad for our country. We groom these people and they get exported, they export themselves and they live as Canadians when they can stay within the country and promote the economy of their own country. So if there's a way that government can look at the outsourcing sector, like the way India did, like the way Philippines did, we are we at Outsource are competing with these two market and are competing very, very well. I can tell you the legal campaign that we have, the client have taken it to India and Philippines and with, they, they took it back to the US. Why? Because uh, uh, it didn't work in India. I don't know why it didn't work, but in Philippines, they have a different legal system. So in Nigeria, we have our law is UK law. And they're able to train them based on the gap training, which is the U.S. law, and they're able to serve that market. So if Nigeria, if the government can structurally look at, look at outsourcing and look at these two areas, one promoting SMEs as, uh, as, a, as, a, as an initiative on its own, and then promote outsourcing, which will, uh, which will create that that employment that uh, uh, that would drive the kind of growth you know the country is looking for. It will solve insecurity. It will solve. Uh, it will solve. Uh, uh, it, you, you know, it will solve a lot of things. It will increase the standard of living of people. It's. It, it will even solve education because a lot of people cannot afford to take their their, their children to school because of lack of employment. So all that. If we're able to solve employment, uh, you know, Nigeria will be in a better place today. Um, Ty, what the next question is for you, um, and I think it's reoccurred several times, so it's important that um, I ask the question. Um, um, in your presentation, um, the, you mentioned that consolidated relief allowance, the, the basis will change. Um, so the questions are, would that mean that employees would have to pay more taxes? Um, how does the consolidated relief allowance for pay as you earn differ from the old one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just to say it as it is, uh, is that yes, if you earn 30,000 era or less in a month, you pay no PAYE, no personal income tax. If you earn more than 30,000, you will be paid slightly more. Uh, of course, there are some people who earn more than 30,000 and they won't pay anything more. But the way I should put it is that the reason why some of us will pay a little bit more is a function of the component of compensation. For example, if you work for an employer that does not even contribute to pension, uh, under the pension reform, uh, they don't deduct any share, they don't do anything, they just pay salary and hope that nobody comes to bother them. So their PAYE will remain the same. And for those of us who comply, and that will be the majority of people on this call. So what used to happen before is, imagine your you know, salary is 100,000 in a month, and your pension contribution for the ease of this analysis is 10,000 error. Before, what you got was, you took out the 10,000 as non-taxable, because that's your contribution to pension. And then that 10,000 is included in the 100,000 when you're calculating your 20% relief. Uh, you know, you know this 20,000, 200,000 plus 20%. Let's ignore the 200,000 so people can understand this. So on the on the 10,000 you contribute to pension, you actually get the 10,000 and 20%, which is 12,000 as a relief. So government is saying, why should I give you a relief of 12,000 naira for a contribution to pension of 10,000 naira? That nobody should have to get more than 100% relief. So what's going to happen now is your salary is hundred thousand, your pension is ten thousand. I'll get, I'll give you ten thousand relief for pension contribution. But when I'm calculating your consolidated relief allowance, it will no longer be on hundred thousand. It will be on ninety thousand, right? So what that means is, in this case, you lose the release or relief of two thousand. 
depending on your band of tax rate, for some people, that will be up to 4,000 naira additional tax you pay monthly. For some people, it may be as low as maybe 1,400 naira. So that's, it will play out differently uh, for different people, but this is, in essence, the principle of what government is doing. And I do agree with that principle, even though we'll say it's coming at a difficult time when people are struggling, but also bear in mind that by exempting the people who are any minimum wage or below, uh, government is losing revenue. There are some states where that is about 80% of their workforce uh, that are paying taxes. So they need to find a, a, a way to try and compensate part of the uh, relief they are giving up for the poorest people. Yes, I'm going to come to you with a difficult one um, because it's a combination of two questions. Um, and they're actually tax-related questions, but um, more like policy relating to corporates. So someone is wondering, actually two people are wondering, um, if tax um, if tax is to redistribute wealth um, and build common infrastructure, why can't the government bring the top 100 brands in Nigeria um, and discuss with them a program on what role each can play in supporting government? Um, and the second one, which is related to that, is, you know, um, the informal sector. Um, someone is saying you may be aware that Nigeria has the highest percentage of businesses working in the shadow in Africa. Um, what initiative should government focus on to bring these, um, you know, informal players into the formal sector? Um, and how can, you know, corporates, um, you know, work with government um, on some of these type of programs. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for giving me the difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on the first one, I think I would say that um, I think government is already doing something similar to what the person is describing. Uh, maybe not in an informal manner, calling, you know, uh, top 100 companies and saying, you know, what can we do to boost that? But I think there are a couple of incentives that government has put in place that is involving the private sector in the development process, which eventually will create more activity, which eventually will create more opportunities for the government to generate more revenues. A good example is the uh, initiative that um, government came out with, uh, whereby it was granting some level of tax relief for um, or private organizations that engage in development, for example. Um, what that does is by allowing the private sector to invest in those kind of infrastructure, it creates the enabling environment for economic activity to thrive. And as economic activity thrives, it also creates an opportunity for government to generate more revenues. Another example is the, uh, the, what we have in the Finance Act 2020, where um, organizations are giving relief for contributions or donations to pandemics or, you know, like we had in the COVID relief. Again, what that does is in allowing, uh, it brings in the private sector to make contributions to uh, certain areas, certain social sectors like healthcare, which when you have a healthy uh, populace would create your, pro will increase productivity of the country and again, create the opportunity for uh, government to generate more revenue. So I think, more can be done, but I think a number of things are already being done in targeting uh, uh, maybe not uh, form, not uh, informally or directly uh, uh, the private sector, but trying to draw them in in this whole uh, um, uh, franchise of trying to develop the economy and boosting uh, the ability for the government to generate more more income. So that's what I'll say on that point. On the second one, uh, where you mentioned the informal sector. And what more can government do? It's a very, very good point, you know. Um, and the person is probably right. I mean, I don't have the numbers, but I recall many years ago, I read a couple of research that did uh, mention that the level of activity in the informal sector was much higher than we had in the uh, formal sector, particularly in Africa. Um, but what I will say to that as well is, before I, you know, make a couple of recommendations, is that where we were is not really where we are right now. And we've seen over the years that um, gradually, and even some of the things the government is doing in terms of the, uh, 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 the kind of policies, fiscal policies that is coming out, like the, the Finance Act and all, 
is drawing in people who are outside of the uh, tax net more into that fold in a way and manner that is easier for them to um, make contributions without necessarily feeling a heavy impact. A good example is, you know, some of the um, initiatives that have been put in place for small businesses, whereby you have a scenario where the small businesses don't necessarily have to pay tax, but we have a situation where we can capture their records. And all that information that we are, uh, that the government is able to get feeds into its ability to tax plan and then also to create a scenario where we can, uh, they can uh, better design the, the, the tax policy and generate more, more income. But one of the things I would mention in drawing in the informal sector, and is what you've seen done in the Southeast Asian uh, countries and a couple of other uh, uh, countries in, in, in Africa, in East Africa and Co., is taking advantage of the use of technology and taking advantage of the use of the fact that a lot of people in the informal sector and now on, uh, you know, on, you know, on mobile phones, you know, on the internet, uh, you know, carrying out more and more of these activities. By, you know, they, the fact that they are now on this platform creates a window of opportunity um, for the government to be able to um, engage them and pull them into the fold to be able to increase revenues. And it, again, you know, it's, which is what I like about one of the things I like about the Finance Act. It doesn't have to necessarily do it uh, directly. I mean, there should be some level of that. But for example, the thing the government, what the government has just done with, res with respect to taxing the uh, digital economy and um, uh, pulling out of that food is a way of increasing the government revenues, taking advantage of the fact that we have an informal populace that is actively engaged in a digital economy. So, so there are things on the technology side that I think the government can do. There are, of course, other things that the government may be able to do as it relates to um, its reach, you know, um, you know uh, in terms of how it uh, encourages or changes the mindset of people as it relates to our responsibility as tax-paying uh, uh, individuals. Yeah. And also, more importantly, being able to channel a lot of those tax revenues into further development and growth. So I just Thanks. say that. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thanks. Thanks for that excellent um, feedback. Um, I know we are run, we've run out of time, but I must ask this question because um, it always comes up. Um, and if Dr. Sarah Alade is still on the call, um, I'm sure she would know that this question always comes up. You know, what you know, we do um, to encourage more people to pay taxes. Um, the question here, and it's not my question, but it comes up all the time, you know, tax utilization, you know, from the perspective of the public, many people say we cannot see what the tax is doing. You know, um, are we encouraged to pay more? So um, is there, you know, something that the government is doing in that regard um, in terms of ses sensitizing the public around how this can go, what the tax is doing, um, which would actually stimulate um, the positive response from, from the public. Uh, thank you, Samuel. I think the issue is communication and the ability of the public to be able to track the Naira and Kobo. Now we are having more transparency in government. You have uh, transparency in budgets, you have transparency around, you can go to the, to, to the website and look at what we're doing. And um, it, we are also getting to a stage where uh, the government is trying to make sure that projects, that citizens will be able to track progress on projects, even in the budget. So if there's supposed to be a borehole somewhere, they should be able to say this borehole is progressing, this borehole is not progressing, the road you promised two years ago hasn't been done or it's been done and then it should be. I think that is what will encourage people to pay taxes. When you know that your money is being used judiciously, when you know that everything you pay is being accounted for, and transparency and accountability is very important. You know, just to 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 encourage 
uh, people to know where the money goes. And this is what the government is working on. Now it's budget, now it's uh, COVID, around COVID-19 expenses, everything to do with COVID-19 expenses. We're saying we have a, a transparency around it, accountability for what the government takes. People refuse to pay taxes then what will the government use? I just spoke earlier on about a budget deficit that was so high and financing it is going to be difficult. If we have revenue, we will not be going for loans and then we will not be going for this much. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the panelists for you know, responding excellently to, to questions, um, both from the public sector perspective, as well as from the government perspective. We cannot take all the questions. Um, but like we said, we have um, resources that you can refer to. Um, we have done an analysis on a sectoral basis on the Finance Act 2020, which is available on our website. Um, we also have um, a best-in-class um, tax application. Um, it's both on Android and iOS called Tax 24-7. When you go there, you see the PwC logo, you download it. It's a repository of all the Nigerian tax and business laws, um, uh, as well as our treaties. And then it also has information um, around, you know, FRS information circulars and, and CBN circulars. Um, there's also the bit around the fact that Tax 24-7 has already been updated in each law that has been amended by the Finance Act. Tax 24-7 has already taken in the amendment. So when you're looking at the laws, you're looking at the most current version of the law. Um, so thank you once again. I thank the audience for their excellent question. I'll hand over to Mary, my partner, um, to take over and wrap up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kenneth. Thank you all so very much. I'm hoping that you can all hear me. Anyway, um, time is far spent. I know that we could go on for another hour. We started off the session, or well, before I go on, I stand on existing protocol, please. We started off the session wanting to know more about the Finance Act, impact on the economy, impact on us as taxpayers, general public, and how it will affect our future outlook. I, I know that the deliberations of the last two hours have made us a lot more knowledgeable about the Finance Act. And if knowledge is power, then we hope PwC that we are indeed more powerful in successfully leveraging, leveraging the Finance Act in our transactions. And of course, as Taiwo said at the beginning, in creating our future. For this very insightful session, I, I, I thank all of our participants, but I especially thank our keynote speaker who went through hell and high water to make sure her voice was heard. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Mrs. Zainab Shamsuna Ahmed, and her representative, who was brought in at very short notice, Dr. Sarah Aladi, for their very useful addition to the conversation. I also thank our other distinguished panelists, Mr. Sam Wanze, CFO of Hairs Oil and Gas, Ms. Amal Hassan, founder and CEO of Outsource Global. I, of course, thank my fellow partners, moderators, and all-round knowledge brokers, Taiwo Oyedele, our fiscal policy partner, West Africa tax leader, Andrew S. Nevin, PhD, our chief economist and West Africa financial services leader for their invaluable contribution to this rich conversation we had today. Of course, I will thank our regional and country senior partner, Mr. Uya Pata, for his continued guidance and for setting the right context through his opening remarks today. Can't forget the role of Kenneth Erikume, my fellow Peter Hussey partner, our tax reporting and strategy partner, for the way he definitely anchored today's session and took us through it seamlessly. It would be remiss of me not to thank all of the PwC personnel and staff behind the scene who made this quite hitch free. Final thanks, of course, goes to you, our audience for taking time out of your busy schedule on a Monday morning on the 1st of February to attend this event and for your very piercing questions. We hope that the session met your expectations and we look forward to your participation at subsequent events hosted by PwC. 
Kenneth had mentioned a lot of the useful resources that we have as, as, as a firm. These and others you can get from our website, www.pwc.com slash ng and other social media platforms as you see on the screen. Please follow us, keep asking questions and we do our best to respond in a timely manner. The event, this event has now ended. Whatever you do for the rest of your day, please do, do it safely. We thank you for your participation. We thank you for your attendance. Goodbye and God bless. Thank you.